this week's drive, we see a former champion in a new suit of clothes. Wrap up the Dakar rally on the beach. Look at what a million dollars buys. And prove there's no limit to the will to win. All this and more in this week's Drive. This is the moment BMW and Sauber Formula One fans have waited for all winter. The new Formula One team unveiled their first car at a launch in Spain, declaring that they aimed to be winning races within three years. BMW, formerly partners to Williams, announced last year that they were buying Swiss-based Sauber and have recruited nearly 100 new staff. One of those is driver Nick Heidfeld of Germany, who comes back to the team after one season at Williams. Heidfeld, who has a three-year deal, agreed the new team would need a lot of luck to win this year, but felt that it was not impossible as the red, white and blue F106 took to the test track for the first time. Key team personnel. It's, it's quite special, first of all, because I spent time with the Sauber team before. I spent three years with them. I also know BMW from last year with, with Williams. Um, and I think there's a very special atmosphere within the team right now because uh, they have the resources. Um, everything is more or less starting uh, from, not really from zero, but this is putting two teams together and uh, that's quite exciting. He's partnered by former world champion Jacques Villeneuve. The 34-year-old Canadian had a poor season at Sauber last year, but he's been retained by BMW. Team principal Mario Thiessen said the team had two number one drivers and the 1997 champion can't wait to get his career back on track. Oh, it's great to, to be part of uh, BMW uh, Sauber team. Uh, BMW has a great history in, in racing, uh, has had uh, many successes. It's, it's a big company, it's uh, got a lot of, uh, of engineers, a lot of, of talent, uh, and also now the team uh, will have a lot of uh, a budget, a lot of money, and that will help to develop the car, to spend time in the wind tunnel, uh, to, to get all the testing we need, uh, which wasn't the case last year, so uh, it's very exciting. We go now to a wintry Silverstone, where Midland F1, Formula One's newest team, welcomed a new face. Max Biaggi has proven himself on two wheels, having won the 250cc World Championship four times. But these are uncertain times for the Italian, who severed his ties with MotoGP racing, motorcycling's top category, after being dumped by his Honda team at the end of the 2005 season. Although Biaggi has discussed a possible move to World Superbikes with Kawasaki, he's also shown interest in a possible four-wheeled future. It's not the first time that Biaggi has driven a Formula One car. In 1999, he did some tests for Ferrari in Italy, something MotoGP champion, compatriot and arch-rival Valentino Rossi has been doing more seriously of late. Max said that there's no competition to see who jumps into F1 first. While 26-year-old Rossi has had three separate Ferrari tests and is seen as a real prospect to switch from two wheels to four, Biaggi is unlikely to be considered for a serious role at Newcomers Midland, even though his outing was at Midland's invitation. With Midland not scheduled to launch its 2006 car until February, Biaggi was invited to drive an older model fitted with a new V8 engine and painted in the new Midland livery. Midland bought out the former Jordan Formula One squad over a year ago, and charismatic former team owner Eddie Jordan attended most of the rounds of last year's World Championship. In his test, Biaggi had to contend with a cold and rain-soaked Silverstone track, the venue for the annual British Grand Prix. Understandably, the Italian drove cautiously in the conditions, completing just nine laps. Max's test was split into three segments, an installation lap, followed by runs of three laps and five laps. Between the second and third runs, he was given a new set of Bridgestone wet weather tires. Although he returned the car to the pits safely and in one piece, it's unlikely the Roman Emperor will be squaring up against Michael Schumacher, Fernando Alonso and the other Formula One stars. Midland have already signed up Dutchman Christian Albers as one of their race drivers, with Portugal's Thiago Monteiro expected to partner him. Biaggi said he was looking forward to another test with Midland, 
but that no firm plans have been made. The new championship starts in a month and things would then be too busy. He said driving the Toyota-powered Midland Formula One was all about getting the right feeling and checking if he really feels comfortable inside it. He was asked by reporters to compare the Formula One with a MotoGP bike, and which he preferred, but he said that he liked both. He was able to dance on a bike to make it go fast, whereas in the car he was strapped in very tightly, which was a weird sensation for him. Asked if he's chasing a Formula One seat, Max said it's too early to say, but he isn't closing any doors. I just take this opportunity to make uh, you know, a day here in the Midland, so they give me this nice opportunity. I want to thank them. The old engineer was so kind to me. Uh, I really appreciate it. and uh, you never know, you know. At, at this time we take things easy and uh, we don't, we didn't make mistakes, that's even more important, because this guy in one month had to start uh, the championship, and for me it was a nice chance, so maybe we'll see next time. <laughs> The 15th and final stage of the 2006 Dakar rally was untimed as a mark of respect to the three fatalities in this year's race. Australian rider Andy Caldicott suffered a fatal crash on his bike before two local boys were killed in accidents in the final days of the event. But for those that made it to Dakar, Sunday represented the end of a gruelling 9,000 kilometre journey after setting off from the Portuguese capital of Lisbon on New Year's Eve. Despite the non-competitive aspect of the stage, the final section along beaches on the Atlantic Ocean to Lake Rosé saw leader Mark Comer keen to get on the throttle and leave nearest challenger Cyril Dupre in his wake. Although he didn't manage a stage win on the event, Comer's consistency proved decisive, with the Spaniard finishing inside the top six on every day to give KTM their sixth successive victory. It was the 29-year-old's first win after coming second last year. Approaching the finish, he was joined by KTM teammate Giovanni Sala, who took third place overall. For the defending cross-country rally world champion, this was a long-awaited victory in the Dakar, which he dedicated to the memory of his teammate Caldicott. And 2005 winner Debre, who struggled on despite a dislocated shoulder sustained in the opening week, was quick to congratulate his rival. In the trucks, Vladimir Chagin and Ferdas Kabarov finished first and third, with Dutchman Hans Stacy preventing a Russian 1-2. It was the fifth win in seven years for the king of truck rallying. A car-class victory went to Luke Alphard in his Mitsubishi ahead of South Africa's Canil de Villiers. World Cup skiing champion in 1997, the Frenchman quit the slopes and competed in his first Dakar rally the following year. He hated the desert at first, but soon grew to cope with the challenging terrain and finished second in 2004 and 2005 behind Stefan Pirahansel. The teams posed for the cameras with Alfam, third place Nani Roma, and Pirahansel, who finished fourth. And 40-year-old Alfam and co-driver Gilles Picard, 10 years his senior, were able to reflect on a job well done. Meanwhile, Volkswagen will think of what might have been with Carlos Sainz in his first Dakar rally slipping to 11th after leading early on in the event and de Villiers and Mark Miller of America finishing second and fifth. Bruno Sabi completed the Touareg Quartet finishing in eighth position. For de Villiers it was a fine result and he praised Swedish co-driver Tina Torna for her excellent navigational work. After two weeks of toil, struggle and tragedy, it was time for the competitors to celebrate, congratulate and reflect. But none more so than Luc Alfam and Gilles Picard, winners of the 2006 Dakar Rally. Despite a strong start by the big Volkswagen team, yet again a Mitsubishi driver led when it counted most. Former World Rally champ Carlos Sainz scored four stage wins on debut. Homer's consistency and rival's misfortune gave him the overall win without topping a single stage. With riders from eight different countries, KTM took nine of the top ten places.
Viktor Shagin claimed his fifth Dakar win in seven starts. Russian Kamaz trucks reigning again, although the Dutch MAN split the team and Japanese and German trucks made a showing. Just two days later, fans were out in force at Barcelona Airport as they waited for bike racer Mark Comer to arrive back in the country. Over a thousand people were on hand to celebrate his maiden win in the bike section of the 2006 event. Coma, who didn't win a single stage this year, was handed his first success when chief rival and defending champion Cyril Dupre dislocated his collarbone on stage six. Three deaths this year have cast a shadow over the Dakar rally, leaving the event looking more controversial than ever. But none of this was in the thoughts of those at Barcelona Airport. For Coma, it was just good to be back home. But when the celebrations do die down, organizers and authorities will start work to improve safety on the competitive tracks and national roads used for the 2007 event. I am really happy, incredible. I thank everyone for supporting me. I hope they enjoyed it as much as I did. They have always been with me, in both the good and in the most difficult moments. Ducati unveiled the men and machines that they hope will take them to MotoGP success this season at the Italian ski resort of Madonna de Campio, just days after the Ferrari Formula One team's annual retreat at the same resort. This season, former Honda star Sete Gibbonau joins the Italian manufacturer following a poor 2005, where the 33-year-old Spaniard finished seventh in the championship after being touted as the rider with the best chance of rivaling Yamaha's Valentino Rossi. Gibbonau felt that last season his team weren't fully behind him, but now, with a new team and a fresh start, the Spaniard is looking forward to the new campaign. Chibonau, who rode for Honda for the last three seasons, joined Ducati last November and replaced fellow Spaniard Carlos Checa. I arrived in, in Ducati with, with a great, great goal, which is the same goal, lucky enough that Ducati, we're all looking forward for a great season. I think it's in a moment that I need Ducati and Ducati needed me, so I think uh, Every time that goes by, every day that goes by, I'm more convinced about what I've done, and Ducati's more convinced, and I know that they're going to be giving 100% to myself, and I'm going to be giving 100% to Ducati, and this is going to take us to good success. Where it's going to take us, only time will say. Giovanao had to settle for seventh place in the world title, won by Valentino Rossi. He finished runner-up to Rossi in 2003 and 2004. The Spaniard has already tested the Ducati Desmo Sedici at Valencia and Jerez and was pleased with the results. Um, first impression with Ducati Desmo Sedici has been good as far as knowing that it's a bike that's very diff different from uh, what I'm, I'm used to. It's a bike that has nothing to do. It's a bike uh, with different tires. It's a bike that really reacts different, but I think it has the package and the, and the, the base to create a bike that, that can fight for the whole championship. Uh, it's a bike that I think we can improve. There's a big margin of improvement, and that, I think, is really a of, big part of, of my motivation for next year, to, to improve. World Superbike champion Troy Corsa took the first steps towards the defence of his title with four days of pre-season testing at Phillip Island. The Australian was trying out the new Suzuki along with teammate Yukio Kageyama. And the early signs are good for the team, with Corsa, champion in 1996 and 2005, topping the timesheets. But more encouragingly, he completed a full 22-lap race simulation, a full half a minute quicker than his race time victory here last March. Kagiyama was not quite up to the pace, but still managed to record laps a second slower than his teammate. Corsa spoke afterwards of his satisfaction with the new bike, which he hopes will take him to a third world title. Yeah, the test here at Phillip Island has gone very well. Uh, the weather has been good, so we've had a good chance to test uh, the new 206 Suzuki. The bike has improved quite a lot in some small areas, uh, with the engine and also with the, the chassis and suspension. So, uh, no, very happy with the, with the test. Consistent, the lap times have been very good, and uh, the feeling on the bike feels very good. The Foggy Patronus team, keen to forget a poor 2005 season, it's a tale of two very different riders. 
making his superbike debut is Craig Jones, the young Briton who showed his promise with two top eight finishes in three supersport races last year. His partner, 136 race veteran Steve Martin, could be the luckiest man in sport. The 36-year-old Australian received a blow to the kidneys in a first corner pileup in last year's final round at Manukur. Tests led to the discovery of a cancerous growth, which has since been removed, and Martin is keen to return stronger than ever. While Jones ended up at the bottom of the lap times, Martin used his local knowledge of the track to split the two Suzukis, and the team could look forward to improving on last year's disappointing sixth place. For Yamaha France, former MotoGP rider Norik Abe carries their hopes of podium finishes after his debut last year. Abe was fourth on the test, a full second slower than Kageyama in third place. Cross to the UK now for something that won't match the speed of a Harley Davidson, let alone a Suzuki Superbike. The Sakura Mustang is an eco friendly, easy rider intended to change the way people look at electric bikes. The Mustang can reach a heady 15 miles an hour, and on a fully charged battery, it will cover around 20 miles for as little as 10 pence. However, as you can see, stability isn't the Mustang's strong point. Apparently, at any speed, it's realistically capable of reaching. Everywhere that we go with a bike, we get crowds of people stop and look at it. Uh, that's what it's all about. This is making a statement. Uh, this isn't just a bike. It makes a statement about the person who's riding it. This isn't for an introvert. This is for someone who wants to be seen. Nick Wilkins's family cycle business west of London has seen all the trends and fads in cycles for over 50 years. And now electric bikes are becoming his best seller. Most electric bikes are similar, running on a rechargeable battery. They all have the advantage of getting from A to B without having to pay any road tax and with the bonus of moving pollution from the cities to wherever the electricity is generated. Uh, I see them uh, really sales taking off within the next few years. And then the more they get about, the more people know about it and uh, will probably want one. Uh, I guess as a shop, we used to sell about one a month and we sell about two a week. The bikes mustn't provide power over 15 miles an hour and no more than 200 watts. Think of it as two reasonably bright electric lights. Worldwide, several million electric bikes are sold every year. The vast majority, admittedly, are in the Far East, but the markets in Europe, the UK and America are opening up very quickly. As fuel prices go up, people are looking for an alternative to using their car, and even, to some extent, using expensive public transport. Not surprisingly, the Mustang is manufactured in China, where over six million electric bikes were sold last year. Apart from being a classic case of form over function, making the bike wobble and hard to ride, another disadvantage is that if the battery's flat, it's far heavier than a traditional bike to pedal home. Surrounded by a phalanx of low-slung white Lamborghinis and two- and four-seater Ferraris of every hue, plus various other European, expensive, beyond-belief exotic cars, the latest version of the world's most pricey and powerful production car, the Bugatti Veyron 16.4, went on show in that home of conspicuous consumption, Los Angeles. The Veyron has been announced repeatedly over the last three or four years, but thanks to its radical four four-cylinder engines on a common crankshaft and almost mythical power output, plus the legendary history of the name, Bugatti's Veyron still commands top billing. Specifications are 1,001 horsepower from a 16-cylinder, 8-litre engine. Top speed is in excess of 400 kilometres an hour, four turbochargers and permanent four-wheel drive. The price tag is 1 million euro, and we just figured it out. I think at the moment it's between 1.2, 1.3 million dollars before tax, so it obviously depends where you buy it. And customers are, well, I think we be addressing ourselves to the normal luxury car customers, whether they're Rolls Royce, Bentley, Ferrari, and so on. It's the same group of people. Additionally, here, because there hasn't been a Bugatti out of the original factory in, in France for 50 years almost. We stopped in 56. So there is a sort of a collector's element in it. 
The Bugatti trademark was in its heyday in the 1920s and 30s as Ettore Bugatti's elegant sportsters often humiliated racing cars two and three times their size. No more than 300 Veyron 16.4s will be built at the factory in France. The west coast of the United States has traditionally been of key importance to the car maker as some of the most valuable vintage Bugattis are owned by American collectors. The, the United States is, is an obvious market for us because uh, there are a lot of collectors, especially in, in, in California. This is why we're here and not in Detroit. And uh, East Coast, West Coast, in the States are very important marketing areas as far as luxury cars in general are concerned. And there's no reason why it shouldn't work for Bugatti either. So. Among Lamborghini's offerings was a roofless spider version of the Gallardo. What was only a concept car a year ago is now in production and on sale. Although it's structurally different to the coupe, it retains a family link and keeps the same mid-mounted 5-litre V10 engine and all-wheel drive transmission, now tweaked up to 512 horsepower for extra acceleration. The car will sell for about 200,000 American dollars. We sold 1,600 cars around the world last year, so this is a new record for Lamborghini, and we sold approximately 650 cars in the US, which is about 40% of the total share of these sales around the world. That is why the American market is so important to Lamborghini. This year, Lambo revealed a new age Miura concept much like the original, now 40 years old. If it gets a positive reception, it too may go into production. 30% of luxury car owners possess more than one high-end vehicle, such as Bentley, Lamborghini or Ferrari, making this show a fashion show for some. A lot of celebrities in particular like the hybrids, but I think they also like high horsepower vehicles too. So I think they kind of counter all the things that they're doing with the high horsepower and the kind of, not gas guzzlers, but certainly they, they consume a lot of fuel with the hybrids. Uh, certainly people who come into this particular hall where we have Lamborghini, Bugatti, Bentley, and Spiker and others, is that they're shopping at Dior, they're shopping at Gucci, and this is kind of a lifestyle choice for them. And here's the clincher. French-built Bugatti, Italian Lamborghini, and British Bentley are all owned by the same German company. Volkswagen. And finally, we head to Thailand for some motorsport that's a long way removed from what we've seen so far, although there's not much motor in this sport. The annual race, which sees races in homemade wooden carts hurtle 200 metres down a dirt track in less than one minute, celebrates the Hmong New Year in the highland areas around Chiang Mai. About 40 competitors wearing their traditional costumes, helmets and gloves raced each other in wild one-on-one -on -one battles. Constant crashes and collisions make the races exciting and amusing for onlookers, most of them dressed in traditional red-blue-black costumes with beaded jewellery. Foreign tourists are also among the bemused spectators. Looks dangerous. Looks very dangerous. Exciting, but dangerous. Accidents are frequent, but injuries are remarkably kept to a minimum. Competitors are allowed to continue the race after a crash, if they're able to. Bales of dried straw are supposed to prevent racers from veering off into the crowds lining the track, many of them cheering on their favourite competitor. The wooden carts have long been used in daily village life, especially for transporting food collected from higher forest areas back down to the village. For the race, competitors are judged on speed and cart design. To be a racer, for those who have never raced, they might feel it is extremely dangerous, but for the racers, this sport is really fun. Montri Pana Amanchai won the event for the second year in a row. First prize is 13,000 baht, about 317 US dollars. Step aside, Schumacher. So, whether you're getting to grips with your new company car, saving for a new toy, or setting new records, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.